If confirmed, Dragon Man, as he's been named, would replace the Neanderthals as our sister species. The discovery of Homo naledi fossils in South Africa stunned the scientific community and fascinated people all over the world. Incredibly, after only a few weeks of digging, researchers were able to unearth 1,550 specimens, representing at least 15 individuals. The field of paleoanthropology was shaken by this finding. They speculated that the creature, whose age in the geological sense is unknown, but whose rudimentary nature was evident given its orange-sized brain, had buried its dead there on purpose. Many scientists believed that only members of the human species are capable of such complex behavior, until now. Evolutionary science has now taught us that humanity has been around for at least two million years in some form or another. Humans are a very recent species. Numerous other human species existed, some of which we interbred with. When then, in the course of evolution, can we legitimately call ourselves people? How might the presence of our long-lost hominid relatives affect our sense of self-identity? Join us as we explore the newly discovered human species and how it raises doubt about the origins of humans. The point at which we crossed over from animal to human is frequently celebrated in our mythology. The knowledge of good and evil came to Eve after she ate from the Tree of Knowledge. Fire was also a gift from Prometheus to the men he fashioned from clay. However, there is no single creative act in the current account of origins and evolution. Instead, humans arose gradually over many generations from more primitive ancestors. Humans evolved gradually over millions of years, much like any other complicated adaptation, such as a bird's wing, a whale's fluke, or our own fingers. Our forebears gradually evolved into something resembling us as mutations in our DNA spread throughout the population. Humans are animals, yet we're not like other species. Complex linguistic systems allow us to express and share our thoughts. We have the ability to create, so we do. Using our creative faculties, we are able to reconstruct the exterior world in accordance with our internal schemas of how the world should be. Our social lives are intricate webs of family, friends, and communities bound by mutual obligation. Whether you call it sentience, sapience, consciousness, or something else entirely, we have an awareness of both ourselves and the cosmos. It might be argued that the distinction between humans and other animals is fictitious. Contrary to popular belief, animals share many similarities with human beings. The great apes are a prime example of this. Primate species like chimpanzees use basic signs and sounds to convey meaning. They have developed rudimentary tools and weapons, and there are clear cultural differences across the clans. Chimpanzees, like humans, have intricate social lives and may work together. Everything that makes Homo sapiens unique – emotion, cognition, language, tools, and society – exists in other species, at least in a basic form, as Charles Darwin pointed out in The Descent of Man. We're unique, but more similar than we realize. Among extinct hominins, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals are the most human-like. There was once a diverse group of hominins, which included humans and apes that behaved similarly to humans. Now, only Homo sapiens remain. They are a diverse group with about 20 described species and perhaps many more that haven't been discovered yet. However, the eradication of other hominins has contributed to the idea that there is an insurmountable chasm separating humans from the rest of the biota of the planet. If those species still existed, however, the divide would be far less distinct. What appears to be a clear demarcation is actually an extinction artifact. The redefinition of that line by the discovery of these ancient species demonstrates the steady, millennia-long closing of the gap between humans and other animals. About six million years ago, our ancestors diverged from those of the chimpanzees. These early hominins were part of the human evolutionary tree, but to our eyes, they wouldn't have looked very human. Hominin evolution was sluggish during the first several million years. The first major shift occurred when hominins learned to walk upright allowing them to leave forested areas in favor of grassland and shrubs. 
Even if the early hominins walked similarly to humans, there is little evidence to suggest that they were more human than apes like chimpanzees or gorillas. The brain size of the first known human, Artipithecus, was lower than that of a chimpanzee, and there's no indication that this species ever developed the ability to utilize tools. Australopithecus appeared in the following million years. The brain size of Australopithecus was comparable to that of a chimpanzee, but less than that of a gorilla. Using sharp stones, it butchered animals with a degree of sophistication just above that of chimpanzees. Then Homo habilis appeared. The brain size of a hominin has finally surpassed that of any other ape. Complex stone tools such as flakes, hammer stones, and choppers emerged. Then for reasons we don't fully understand, human evolution sped up roughly two million years ago. Homo erectus first showed up at this time. Erectus had huge brains up to two-thirds the size of our own and was taller and more humanoid in stature than chimpanzees. They were able to create complex tools, such as hand axes made of stone. This was a huge step forward in technology. Making a hand axe required forethought and precision. You probably needed a teacher to show you the ropes. Perhaps it served as a meta-tool, from which spears and digging implements were fashioned. Homo erectus shared our tiny molars and canines. That points to a change in diet, away from plants and toward meat, most likely gained through hunting. A common theory about human evolution that has been around for a long time is that we evolved to eat more meat and other animal products. Scientists hypothesized that the large and energy-demanding brains associated with our own species could have evolved from the shift to a diet more heavily weighted toward meat, beginning with the appearance of Homo erectus some two million years ago. Butchery markings on fossilized bones made with stone tools suggested an increase in meat consumption after this time, raising the question of whether or not this finding was due to an increase in the amount of fossil material available from this time period. Back in January of last year, W. George Washington University's Andrew Barr and his colleagues combed through every piece of fossil evidence for butchery in Eastern Africa, dating back 1.2 million years or more. The researchers concluded that there is no strong relationship between eating more meat and the evolution of larger brains in our ancestors, and that the evidence for increased carnivory in our ancestors is merely an effect of increased sampling of the archaeological record at certain time intervals beginning around two million years ago. Perhaps it was the act of preparing meat, rather than ingesting it, that allowed for the development of larger brains. By decreasing the amount of energy needed to digest food, cooking improves nutritional absorption. At least a million years separate the oldest evidence of human control of fire from the first evidence of using fire to prepare food. Here is where the pace of our development appears to quicken. The huge-brained Erectus quickly spawned even more advanced hominins. Intelligent and adaptable, these hominins eventually gave rise to Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo and early Homo sapiens across Africa and Eurasia. Stone-tipped spears and fire-making emerged, marking a significant technological advancement. Jewelry and other works of art with no obvious practical use have also emerged within the previous half-million years. The Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis, had brain sizes similar to our own and became much larger over time, eventually reaching modern human levels in the brains of the very last Neanderthals. It's possible that they talked among themselves as if they were human. Archaeological evidence of Neanderthals reveals behaviors that are distinctively human, pointing to a similar mental architecture to our own. Hunting everything from rabbits to rhinoceroses and woolly mammoths, the Neanderthals proved to be adept and flexible predators. Their technology was advanced to the point that they could create spears with stone tips for throwing. They created cave paintings, jewelry out of shells, animal teeth, and eagle talons. And just like modern humans, Neanderthal hearing was fine-tuned to pick up on linguistic nuance. We have evidence that they buried their deceased and likely had funerals. We will never know all there is to know about Neanderthals, but if their skeletons and behaviors were so similar to ours, it's reasonable to assume that they were also like us in ways that don't leave a record, such as singing and dancing, fearing spirits and worshiping gods, gazing at the stars in awe, sharing stories with friends, laughing and loving their children. 
Neanderthals must have been capable of extraordinary acts of generosity and empathy, but also of cruelty, violence, and dishonesty, to the extent that they were like us. New discoveries made in a cave in southeast France in February of last year add a layer of complexity to the story of human and Neanderthal co-occupancy in Europe, which brings us back to our original point about species interactions. Evidence of hominin habitation was discovered by a team from the University of Toulouse, led by Ludovic Slimak. They found that Neanderthals and modern humans coexisted at the Grotta Mandarin site in France. This modern human occupation, as shown by lithic and fossil evidence, predates the prior record of modern people in this region by over 10,000 years. This data not only shows that Neanderthals and modern humans coexisted for a considerable amount of time, perhaps hinting that our arrival in Europe did not drive Neanderthals to extinction, but also that the two species took turns inhabiting the same spot. This longer period of contact may also have genetic ramifications, providing more evidence for when and where modern humans and Neanderthals interbred. There's a possibility that Homo sapiens kidnapped Neanderthal women, or vice versa. But humans had to not only mate, but also successfully nurture children, who grew up to have children of their own, for Neanderthal genes to penetrate our communities. If these unions were the consequence of intentional mixing, then that is more likely to occur. They had to accept their hybrid offspring into their communities and treat them as completely human because of the genes they shared. We would argue that these same points apply to other species we interbred with, such as the Denisovans and any undiscovered hominins in Africa, as well as the Neanderthals. That doesn't mean there wasn't animosity or conflict when our species met others. It's possible that we as a species are to blame for the annihilation of those communities. There have to be moments when we are able to put aside our differences and see our common humanity. In conclusion, it's instructive to consider the length of time it took to replace these other hominins once we did. It took thousands upon thousands of years for species like the Neanderthals and Denisovans to die out. It's inconceivable that Neanderthals and Denisovans could have resisted modern people for as long as they did if they were just brutish idiots incapable of language or complex cognition. Why did we get rid of them if they were just like us? The lack of clarity suggests that the distinction has to do with a factor that does not leave telltale traces in fossils or stone implements. Maybe we were ahead of the game because we had a creative streak, whether it was a talent for language, tool making or social graces. The distinction, if any, was not glaring. Otherwise, we wouldn't have needed so much time to triumph. Up to this point, we have avoided answering what is undoubtedly the most crucial question. It's interesting to think about how we as a species evolved, but what exactly is humanity? Without a clear definition, it will be impossible to research and identify. Many individuals believe it is okay to buy, cook, or eat a cow, but they would never consider doing so to a butcher. The common belief is that we humans have some essential distinction from the animal kingdom. People generally believe that it is acceptable to buy, cook, and eat a cow, but it is not acceptable to buy, cook, and eat the butcher. We are fine with keeping apes like chimpanzees and gorillas in zoos, but we would feel quite strange about doing the same thing to each other. In a similar vein, we can buy a puppy or a kitten from a pet store, but we can't buy a baby. For us, it's a different set of rules than for them. We have always considered ourselves to be on a higher moral and spiritual level. Even if we buried our dog or cat, we wouldn't think that they would come back to harass us from the grave or that they would be waiting for us in heaven. But it's not easy to find proof of such a basic distinction. The word humanity connotes caring for one another and showing compassion. However, these characteristics may be more characteristic of mammals than humans. Both a mother cat and a dog will do anything for their young, and a dog will adore his master more than anybody else. Family relationships are extremely important to both killer whales and elephants. Elephants have been observed visiting the graves of their deceased friends, and orcas have been observed crying over their dead calves. Relationships and emotional lives are not something we invented. Maybe what makes us unique is our level of self-awareness. Dogs and cats, on the other hand, appear to be cognizant of our presence. They treat us as though we are individuals and return the courtesy. They have a deep enough understanding of us to manipulate us into feeding them, letting them out the door, 
and spending lonely evenings with them. What else could it be if not consciousness? Yes, the ability to treat illness is not unique to humans. It wasn't until last year that researchers led by Simone Pica from the University of Osnabrück discovered apes employing topical ointments for healing. While it's long been known that elephants, bears, and other primates eat stuff for therapeutic purposes, the wild chimpanzees of the Rakambo group in Gabon would grab insects, squash them between their lips, rub the insect into a wound, and then discard the insect. What makes this study so remarkable is the fact that the chimpanzees treated not only their own wounds, but also the wounds of other chimpanzees. Once thought to be unique to our own species, it now appears that compassion for one's fellow humans may have deeper evolutionary roots. In a second new study from July, Pascal Gagneau and Ajit Varki of the University of California, San Diego used a genetic and medical lens to investigate the origins of the extraordinary longevity of modern humans. To provide for loved ones, especially grandkids, grandmother hypothesis proponents, argue that modern humans continue to live long past sexual maturity. But when and how did this increased longevity emerge? Protecting one's brain from inflammation and dementia as one gets older is made possible in modern humans by a gene called CD33, which generates immunological receptors, like specialized portions of immune system cells. These CD33 receptors may have been an evolutionary advantage for our species, but the fact that the gene for them is absent in Neanderthals and Denisovans suggests that we had to acquire it independently. Our large brains are another distinguishing feature, but can it alone guarantee our humanity? The bottlenose dolphin's brain is slightly larger than the human brain. The brain size of elephants is three times that of humans, while that of orcas is four times and that of sperm whales is five times. Humans show a wide range of brain sizes. There must be more to being human than just a large brain. Maybe the minds of animals, even those that have since become extinct, are more complex than we give them credit for. Higher order cognitive skills like art, math, music, and language could be used to characterize what it means to be human. Due to individual differences, this poses an interesting conundrum. How can we claim to be special if we don't know where we come from or where we end? When we can't even agree on what makes us human, how can we justify treating other species as if they were intrinsically inferior? Neither are we the inevitable culmination of human history. We were just one kind of hominid, yet we ended out victorious. One could, however, conceive of an alternate evolutionary trajectory, a different set of mutations and historical events that would have resulted in Neanderthal archaeologists examining our peculiar bubble-shaped skulls and questioning how human we really were. Because of how evolution works, there is no simple way to classify living creatures. Evolutionary change is possible because species morph into one another over time and because every member of a species is unique. But that complicates attempts to define human nature. Because of natural selection, we're distinct from other creatures. Our common heritage, though, makes us similar. We, humans, share a common ancestor with other Homo sapiens, but are also distinctly individual due to our evolutionary history and the specific set of genes we inherited from our parents, extended families, and even extinct hominins like the Neanderthals and Denisovans. Evolution constantly alters things, creating numerous species and variations within species, making it difficult to classify living things in tight categories. And what a wide variety there is. Each of us must define and discover what it is to be human, as there are countless facets to the human experience and myriad ways to be human. One of what makes us human is the paradox that we can't agree on a single definition of humanity. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.